Last week, I made a video about the area I grew up in. There were smugglers, pirates, tunnels and hillsides, gravestones with skulls in them. It was busy. And that's all very well, but there's a degree of luck involved. If you grew up in the sticks, in a country like this, there's quite a lot of history around, even if sometimes it is just the fashions. But what if you live in a city? What if you live in the burbs? What if you're stuck there because you've got COVID? Ah! Challenge accepted. This is a bungalow. Specifically, this is my bungalow. Sorry, specifically, this is our bungalow. It looks a bit better when it's got a summer coat on. It even has pampas grass. Watching the 70s was kind of code. A bit like turning up at a party and being presented with a glass bowl with everyone's car keys in it. Maybe that's your first bit of history. But maybe something more substantial would be better. Luckily I'm allowed out in person now, which saves me having to go by drone. In order to find something really historic, we kind of have to go around the corner and over the road. This is Kingsnow Park, or Dovecot Park, or sometimes Roundel Park. This whole area is called Kingsnow, which sounds quite posh, but has less to do with royalty and in fact more to do with a farmer who was called William King. Sometime in the 18th century he owned this land or rented the land and farmed it out. Not to be confused with King William, who is, well, a whole other can of worms. And now is kind of a small hill. In America, I suppose you'd call it a knoll. Between the 17th and the 19th century, this was actually a quarry, which is probably the only reason it's not been built on yet. The stone produced here was known as Red Hall Stone. Edinburgh's famous for being built of sandstone, and quite a lot of the stuff that built the city and a lot of the landmarks actually came from right under my feet. My favourite thing about Kingsnow Park, or Dovecot Park, or Roundel Park, or whatever flavour you want to give it, is that in the winter, it's the perfect venue for tobogganing. As demonstrated by this absolute sledgeend. A dovecot, in case you're wondering, is a little house that's made for doves. Usually rich people had them built as follies in the past. I'll pop a link in the description to this video to one my brother made, where he actually built one out of sandstone. It's pretty cool. I mentioned that the park actually has three names, with the other name being Roundel Park. The Roundel in question was actually a small grove of trees at the top of where the park is now. In the summer of 1650, across the backdrop of the English Civil War, Oliver Cromwell parked his cannons roughly where I'm standing now, as he tried to blast his way into the city. Having just seen off one of the Stuart Kings, he was a wee bit worried about a Scottish uprising, so he reckoned he had to take Edinburgh. In order to get in, he had to get past Red Hall Tower, which is just down the hill in front of me. The local laird held out for days. In the end, they had to wait for him running out of ammunition so they could get near the place. Then they had to do a Michael Caine and blow the bloody doors off. Cromwell was so impressed with the laird's bravery, he held on to him for 10 days and then set him free. But what about something closer to home? This is an avocado bathroom suite. Not what you're looking for. Fair enough. Outside. My favourite thing about this house is actually something we saw in the home report shortly after we bought it. Everything was fine. Roof didn't leak. Yeah, right. It was insulated. Usual kind of thing. Oh, and the Anderson shelter appeared to have some water ingress. Anderson shelter? Anderson shelters were built around the outbreak of World War II. They were named after Sir John Anderson, who was the Home Secretary and the Minister for Home Security at the time. There were around 1.5 million built by the outbreak of the war, and a further 2.1 million constructed during the war. Now there are probably only a few left. When we moved in, I was of course a responsible husband and father, busy ensuring all the boxes were in the right places. But to be honest, my number one consideration was finding this thing. And it turned up behind the garage. It's pretty dark and it's full of mud and we're using it as a log store. Interestingly, somebody seems to have been brewing moonshine down here. I had thought that the hole in the wall behind me was a window, which makes zero sense. I mean, let's face it, flying glass is probably never a good idea. 
But having done some research, I now realise it's actually an escape hatch, which makes quite a lot more sense, because if the other entrance get blocked, you're pretty much stuck here, which is also never a good idea. These things were never really designed to take a direct hit. They were more for stopping the stuff that would have landed on top of you landing on top of you. So inevitably, if they worked as they should have been, the chances are the entrance would have wound up getting blocked off. I like it, but it's not an Anderson shelter. Real Anderson shelters were made with 14 pieces of galvanised steel. They had curved roofs and they were buried in the earth. This thing's made of brick. You can still see the brackets where the benches must have been. I don't imagine it would be the most comforting place to shelter from Nazi bombs. Although I don't suppose anywhere really is. It must have been absolutely terrifying sitting down there not knowing what was going to happen. A bit like those parties in the 70s, I suppose. I feel like this would make a very good man cave. Next week, I'll be in St Andrews, trying to work out why a peculiar method of execution became our national flag. See you then.